Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to have to do a very cross speech and show. I'm going to. Good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> I always wanted to do that in the style of Good Morning Vietnam. Anyway, um, ladies and gentlemen, um, as President of Chamber of Commerce, I am delighted to welcome you all here today. Um, as you'll see, we're absolutely jam packed and we're actually starting ahead of schedule because as well as a capacity crowd of 150 in the room, we also have, for the first time ever, 120 joining us through live streaming. Uh, it's fair to say this has been our most popular event of 2021, which probably says something in itself. So with our usual thanks to our sponsors, Island, um, who I hope feel they're getting value for money with that packed crowd, um, we are very pleased to see all of you in the room and those joining remotely. Now, by August and September this year, um, we at Chamber were being absolutely deluged with feedback about what we were told was a recruitment crisis. It came from all quarters. It came from hospitality. It came from retail, construction, cleaning, carers, all sectors, all professions, all backgrounds. And we heard people reference the fact that they had made it through COVID but they were now despairing about whether they could carry on. And the problem has become particularly acute, it seems, for the SMEs who make up some 70% of our membership. We sent out a survey last week. Thank you to the people who responded. It was our best ever response, over just about 200 people coming back to us. I'm not going to steal the thunder of the panel who are going to reference that, but it's fair to say the feedback we had from people was very much confirmed by the feedback that's written into those survey results. So we can't change the past, we can't cure Brexit, sorry folks, we can't control COVID effects in global commerce, but what we can do is identify ways within Guernsey whereby we can improve our situation, ways whereby we flex the policies and procedures uh, which have an impact and which affect how easy it is to get staff into our businesses and how much it costs. And we have seen, and I'd like to start off by thanking Rob and his team at Population Management Home Affairs, some very helpful announcements come through in the past few days. But we want to look at things today at a much bigger top level, the macro level, if you like, and to look at an open mind and holistically about the big picture to work out where we Guernsey PLC are and what we are going to do to tackle the issue. So it's very much intended to be forward looking and fixing it. We are incredibly lucky to have a fantastic panel. I'm sure you're going to agree. And if I may say particular thanks to our Chief Minister, uh, Peter Fairbrush. We know how incredibly busy you are, P Peter, um, and we are truly grateful for you sparing the time to be here on this. We're extremely pleased also on the political side to have Rob, Rob Prow from Home Affairs, completing, if you like, the political lineup. We have um, Kenny McDonald from the Guernsey Retail Group. He's a board member there and he's also director of the co-op. We have Nick Graham at the end from OSA Recruitment, who's very much, if you like, in the eye of the storm. Um, I think, yep. We have Gary, I nearly forgot, how could I forget? Um, Gary Blatchford, Population Management Administrator. Gary's very much again in the front line, changing things, fixing things, flexing things. He's here to answer any practical questions. And last, but definitely not least, we have the wonderful James Jim Fowler, editor of the Guernsey Press, who's going to guide us through the debate this afternoon. Now, I'm gonna finish with a few housekeeping points. The last time we did a seminar in here, the mic stopped working halfway through. First of all, sorry about that. Secondly, if it happens again, shout, let us know and we'll fix it. Um, if you're asking a question, please identify your name. That will be later on. Um, and turn off your phones, settle down and get ready for a fantastic debate. Thank you, everyone. Afternoon, everybody. I'm James Jim Feller. So bad they named him twice. Anyway, um, but looking forward to having a, a very good conversation today with our, with our panel on this uh, a very interesting uh, topic. 
you know, when I saw the title of this event, I thought, is recruitment crisis over-egging the situation here? But I think the turnout, and frankly, the, the timing of the turnout, as in everybody here when I walked in thinking I'd be first person here, uh, was a bit, uh, you know, indicates that uh, it, we are talking about a crisis here. Um, you know, when was the last time that we had restaurants closing, closing temporarily, restricting opening hours uh, in Guernsey? Uh, you know, it's a mix of population management regime with a pinch of COVID, a bit of an economic downturn in certain sectors and a boom in others, and throw in Brexit for good measure, and you certainly got a bit of a mess on your hands. So uh, the states and the business sector are making the best of things. We're going to hear from them uh, today by turning to our panel and initially asking them, uh, how is it for you? And my, so I'm going to lead off with uh, Chief Minister Deputy Peter Furbrush. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. I hope you can hear me. Now, when I made a speech last week under the tax review uh, in the States, I referred to two mythical characters. One was Mr. McCorber, who wanted uh, things to turn up. We'll see how things are going to turn up, Mrs. McCorber. Uh, well, we know that doesn't happen in real life. And the other was that Scottish uh, private in Dad's Army who said, we're doomed, we're doomed. Well, we're not doomed, but we've got a, lot, a hellish of a lot of problems. And uh, we've got a problem which we're not unique to, but I mean, we all live in Guernsey, we do our business in Guernsey. Uh, I've got interest, as people know, in the hospitality trade, and we brought in, we've had to bring in people from Kenya. We've had great, great assistance uh, from uh, Rob's team, from Gary's team, uh, from Peter Nee's team, uh, but it's still bloody difficult because there's a shortage worldwide of these type of people. So uh, we, I'd like to hear from you today by way of questions and after by any means you want as to what you think we can do, because I think we're going to try and be a proactive state. We're not a state like some of our predecessors who wanted to uh, chew everything to the last degree and uh, talk and talk, but don't do anything. But we don't have the answers. We're not, we're not Solomon. Uh, we're there as, I'm a, I was a humble advocate, so now I'm a humble politician. But in relation to that, we don't have those answers. We need to have help and assistance and guidance from you. Anyway, I was told it was only 90 seconds by James, we're up to two minutes, so I'll keep to that. When I, you know, the legal profession, I talk for hours and hours because I got, I could charge by every six minute unit, but uh, I can't do that <laughs> anymore. So I'll sit down and let somebody else speak. Peter, though, I will ask one more question of you. Obviously, you, you have an involvement in the hospitality industry. Can you yes. just give us an indication about how things have been for you in that sector? Very difficult. You talked about closure of restaurants. We've got four restaurants. We've got uh, the Boathouse, Christie's, Crabby Jack's, uh, and uh, uh, the Chop House. All great value, by the way, and all very varied, and you're all welcome. <laughs> Sadly, no discounts. But in relation to that, we couldn't open the boathouse at all this summer because we just didn't have enough staff. I mean, it opened the odd function. Crabby Jacks, which, you know, really, that should be open throughout the summer. At the height of the summer, we have 11 chefs. We were down to four. So we had to restrict the day hours, restrict the days, restrict the menu. That was the same to a lesser degree with the other two. We just closed the Chop House for three weeks. I'm sure... I know that, for example, uh, Octopus is closed. I know other restaurants have had to restrict their activity. Ian, I'm sure, is nodding there. I'm sure he has to with his hotels. It's been, to use a phrase, I hope nobody minds, it's been bloody difficult. OK, let's continue on that theme. So, uh, uh, Kenny, if I could turn to you, Kenny, um, as head of retail operations at, at the co-op. So we've heard a little bit about hospitality. Now, from a retail perspective, how's your staffing situation been over the last uh, year or so? Well, I think... Um, Immediately from now, um, we're seeing several challenges with recruitment and the recruitment levels that we're looking for are, you know, sometimes, well, not sometimes, or actually, but six, seven times what we'd normally experience this side of the year. So as it sits in retail, we've got about 200 full-time equivalent vacancies across the, the retail sector, um, which, is, um, which is a huge percentage of um, the challenge that we've got for particularly facing it the Christmas peak seasonal trading period. Um, you know, my business, we would normally have about five or 10 vacancies, part-time, full-time. Um, we've got about 20 full-time vacancies, um, but the overall retail business, whether it be small businesses, non-foods, um, clothing, um, certainly the food retailers are all feeling the pressure with um, that significantly high number of um, current vacancies that we, we, we see. Um, we know we're not alone. You know, we, we talk to the hospitality industry. We see that they're under the same uh, challenges. Um, it's hard to get a picture for the whole of the island, but you know, anywhere between a thousand and fifteen hundred vacancies we hear, which I think highlights the scale of the problem. Um, unemployed, um, you know, three hundred and fifty, three hundred and sixty unemployed. 
probably 120 heads more than this time pre-COVID pandemic. Um, so certainly that's not going to fill our vacancies, hospitality vacancies, building, you know, construction industry. Um, so it's certainly, a, I would say it is a massive challenge. Um, and I would say it is something that we need to be doing more to support. In terms of the recruitment issues you have at the co-op, how many of, uh, of your vacancies would you typically fill with people from outside of the island? That, that's a difficult one, James. You know, I think uh, retail, we've benefited in the past from guest workers, seasonal workers that have worked in hospitality, that have come with family members or partners, um, and they, they themselves have worked part-time in, in our retail stores. Um, we don't have a terrible large amount of licences. I think, you know, Gary and his team have been very supportive, particularly during the pandemic with the emergency legislation that came in. Um, and we had probably 300 colleagues from hospitality working in retail during the peak pandemic. But that's not the answer. The answer isn't for us to poach from another industry. Um, we are seeing a lot of colleagues leaving the island as opposed to, you know, relying on guest workers. Um, a lot of colleagues that were from Latvia, Portugal, Madeira, are leaving the island because it's too expensive, cost of living's a challenge. And I guess um, there's been lots of you know, life lessons, I guess, with COVID and the pandemic, not seeing families and the pressures of um, returning back to their, their homeland, shall we say. Yeah, okay. Thanks, Kenny. Um, let's move on to Nick Graham, who doesn't do banking trust uh, or fund administration, but he is representing the finance industry today with his uh, uh, recruitment agency uh, hat on from OSA. So, Nick, uh, can you give us a, a, the outline of the position yeah. from, from that sector, please? Is this working? Yeah. Um, I think OSA is probably typical of four or five of the busier recruitment agencies in that we probably deal with the financial services more, you know, 85% more financial services. Um, and we currently have 300, 330 jobs on our websites, which most will have. And that's back up to pre-pandemic levels. So we, we've come out the other side, and that's positive. That's across funds, trust, accountancy, compliance, all the areas which are really, really hot. And I've, I've been in recruitment many years, but and I would say the past 12 to 13 years or so, um, we've seen that vacancies have been difficult and challenging to fill. But where we are today is most difficult job market I've seen in 30 years plus. Um, I wouldn't necessarily call it a crisis as such, but I think it's really difficult and challenging. Um, and in preparation for this presentation, I spoke to many businesses who would probably share that view. Um, one comment was that it's not a crisis, just a huge competition for limited talent. Um, and I, I don't think it's unreasonable to think that the job market's only going to get more challenging. Uh, there's a crisis around the housing, obviously, which we're going to talk about. Um, and whilst it's not a crisis as such now, I think it could easily be in six or nine months' time. Um, we just did a SNAP survey at OSA, which probably supports some of the findings that um, Kay produced in that survey. And it said that 86% of businesses were either retaining the levels of staff or we're increasing their staffing levels in the next 12 months you can't pin your hat on that by the way but it's a general trend i think that is probably across the room um what is the concern i think is that when we can't match the demand for jobs you're coming out of the pandemic as kenny alluded to i think people have got some serious life choices about life balance about cost of housing anecdotally i've heard stories this week of people just leaving their jobs and, or, or uh, resigning and, th and they're not going to other jobs in Guernsey. And I don't think there's real life, um, sorry, real time evidence or data that supports where that will be, although we probably know more in 12 months time. Um, so I think there is a concern about wage spiral costings coming up. Um, and I just think we're in a perfect storm here of Brexit, Brexit COVID housing crisis, limited labor pool across all of the sectors. Hasn't it always been the case in financial services that there's been loads of vacancies and everybody would have employed two or three or four or five more people if they could? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And instead, they just haven't because you just can't yeah. really find the people. So that, that, that figure, let's say there's 350 vacancies on Situations website or Leapfrog and OSA, for example, it doesn't mean that if you had suddenly had 500 other skilled people that they wouldn't all get gobbled up. 
Yes, so the, the finance industry is a hungry beast who would always look to, to take Absolutely. more attention. Yeah. But would you fear that that is actually restraining economic performance? That if firms were able to have five more people each or whatever, they could actually do better? I think where businesses are right now in terms of not being able to find or, or recognising there's a difficulty, they're now looking clearly at automated stuff or outsourcing off island. Um, and I, I can't put a figure on how many people we need. Yeah, okay. So, so we've heard the um, extent of the problem. Um, Rob, you've got a million things on your plate at, uh, at Home Affairs, uh, and this one, I guess, has, has risen to the top of the menu. Um, you know, can you give us an indication of, of how you're trying to help? Yes, uh, th thank, you. thank you, James. Um, very, very nice to be here, and I think, uh, as uh, in the introduction, uh, the, the turnout uh, and, the, and the live streaming shows how an important that issue it is. Uh, in the introduction, we talk, talked about looking looking forward, and I think that is certainly the, the approach uh, from the Committee of Home Affairs. But um, it, it's more than that, because the cross-committee team that are looking at it, um, uh, we've, got, we've got the chief, chief minister, and by the way, I'm only here to make him look good. Uh, <laughs> And so we've got, the, we've got the chief minister, but we've got four people from uh, uh, the, the president of economic uh, de development and four, four other members of the economic development on it. Uh, I, I've got Simon Vermeulen, my, my vice, vice president. We've also got the pre pre president of ESS and the president of um, education, sports and culture. I only say that just to emphasize how um, seriously I think the government takes it. It, we we, uh, we worked very hard to put it in the go government work plan, and if you think about it, that government uh, work work plan was put together and is in, in progress already in this term. And uh, as as you said, James, um, population management, immigration, um, are right up there as as a, as a priority. And we we've we've had our first meeting. We've scoped out the work. We've done terms of reference, which you can all find on the gov.gg website. Um, and uh, I, I'd ask you all to have a look at that. If you've got any feedback, we're certainly very much in listening mode. Um, so so that, that's, that's the looking forward uh, bit. Lots of work to do there, uh, and we will be doing a, poli um, a policy letter. In the shorter term, it's already been alluded to. Um, it was always said last term that the population management um, regime was flexible. Well, I think this term we've, we've proved that it is. It's only flexible where you get politicians working together, economic development, home affairs working together, um, listening to listening to industry, and um, uh, the chief minister has already given praise to uh, the population management administrator Gary Salter and Peter Nee in the immigration team. There are constraints. Um, uh, Brexit is 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 a constraint. But well, post Brexit, Brexit is a constraint. The pa pandemic. If you look at the global situation. Um, the, the, the pandemic has changed work, working uh, practices, and, and Nick has, uh, alluded to that, that as well. And I think I was one of the first in the media to describe this as a perfect storm. Um, and it's OK saying that, you know, this is a global problem, but it's incumbent upon us uh, lo locally to, to work with you guys and, and come out of this the best, best we can. Uh, and working with those con constraints and mitigating them. Rob, you've said to me, Rob, that actually, you know, global, uh, global, global crisis, you know, problems for Guernsey. Specifically, though, you have actually, you feel at the moment that you are trying to, you know, to get in, to get the economy into a better place through what you can do. And I move on to Gary in terms of the specifics of this, but you've actually taken quite a bit of action to ease things, haven't you, over the last few months? Yes, yes, James. We 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 absolutely have, but um, there there is still more to do. We, we've got we've got to look at this in the round. We're, mem we're members of the co common tra travel area, uh, and there are there are constraints. But cer certainly, what what we what we are trying to do is look at the immigration re regime, and the population management uh, uh, regime in the round. But cer certainly, we, we we've pushed it as, as far as we as we can particularly around uh, try, trying to make it easier for, for people that are already established and work, working here uh, to, to stay stay longer. So we, we, we've, we've pushed, pushed that out on a temporary basis 
for, for two years. We've also pushed out the, the 9-3 re re regime. And, and also we, we, we've looked at um, the, the open market and, and made it easier for open market youngsters who uh, once, they, once they've once they got their qualify, uh, qualifying years in to, to move away from the open market um, uh, accommodation and find their own. And uh, I have to say that all, all these initiatives have, uh, have been very well, well received, which is, um, which is quite good in a political environment because uh, quite often we get, and, and rightly so, we get a lot of stick. Rightly so, you get a lot of stick. I'll make a note of that. Remember that for the good times. <laughs> um, uh, I'll move on to Gary. Gary Sorto is the Deputy Administrator, I believe, of Population Management. Thanks for coming today, Gary. It's nice to see a civil servant appearing for real. I'm sorry about your uh, name uh, issue uh, a little earlier on. I'm the but, administrator as well. Uh, you're the administrator, right. You need to update your LinkedIn, I think. Um, but, <laughs> anyway, um, thanks. Nice to see you here. Um, Rob's just alluded a little bit to, uh, to the issues you're doing. Can you just give us a, you know, that real cold face uh, uh, idea of what you know, what you've been up to and how you've been able to respond from population management. Yes, yeah, sure. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So, uh, as as we've identified, there, there's two parts to this. Really, it's the looking forward part, but there's dealing with the challenges that that are very real for businesses now on a day to day basis. And what we've what we've tried to do is develop some policies that are going to ease that immediate pressure and just buy us a little bit of time while we take a broader look at the situation through the through the wider review so i can talk about the policies in in more detail but a general message is if you have staff and you want to keep them you can and if you can find staff and you want them to come to the island you can get a permit for them and it's it's really that simple from a population management perspective can you just outline to us gary a little bit about um how guernsey has to handle the complexities of brexit in terms of uh, in terms of visas and, yeah. and bringing people into the island, so there is an additional layer now for any new EU nationals wishing to come and live and work in Guernsey, uh, and they now require a UK issued <coughs> visa, and there's no getting around that. That that's part of our, uh, as Deputy Prow highlighted, part of being the common travel area, and it's the UK that. Uh, administers that visa, the UK get the, the fees for that visa. As everyone will be aware, the UK have adopted a, a, a different uh, immigration system. They're going for a points-based system, so they're targeting higher skilled, uh, high earning roles. What Guernsey have been able to do, partly, in, uh, partly facilitated by the fact that we have a population management law, we have an employment permit policy, we've been able to use the data that sits behind that those permits and have a discussion with the UK whereby we've been able to clearly evidence that we have a need for roles in hospitality or uh, commercial cleaning, all these many roles where there's uh, recruitment difficulties now. So whilst an EU national can't go and do that job in the UK because they wouldn't qualify, they can come and do that job in Guernsey. So we've, we've opened up a route for EU nationals to mitigate that impact. So. From that perspective, Brexit has, has partly been mitigated in that sense. And, uh, interesting, you have to negotiate with the uh, UK on that basis. Are they all right with that, with the Guernsey approach? That's been something that's been led more by Peter Nee and the immigration right. team. What, and, and Deputy Proud is very well cited on this, yeah. but in, in general terms, fact, do you have to put it there to answer that? Would you, would you like me to, to yeah, sure, comment on yes, that? Yes, yeah, so certainly um, uh, we are we are bound by uh, um, our immigration regime is uh, runs through the extended immigration acts, which are, which are uh, the same immigration acts that apply in the UK are extended here with modifications. What we do have is a an ability to set our own immigration work permit policy. Um, so, uh, so what we what we've done is we've made our policy different to the immigrant, uh, the, the one in the UK, which is a points based system. And as as Gary's outlined, that has enabled us to uh, um, use the population management regime to um, uh, convince that the, the 
United Kingdom that we're, we're not really um, uh, pushing the envelope envelope too far. So, so, so basically, we don't have to go through the uh, uh, follow the UK points based system. But where where we rub up against the UK is where we if they perceive that we would be giving a uh, route to settlement that um, that wouldn't be achieved through the, through the UK points based system. Now that's a, quite a, a complicated answer to the, the question. But this this is what this is one of the the, the, the difficulties uh, and one of the challenges for us is to. Um, basically see where we are able to deviate from the UK uh, a policy and we, uh, in a way that suits our own, own industry. And so far, we, um, we have been um, able to convince the, the United Kingdom that um, basically the controls we have through population management are sufficient. But I, I, all I would say is that um, the, the, the UK are, are looking closely at, at what we're doing. Uh, particularly as we've started uh, a regime that is, is more liberal than, than that applies in the UK, or indeed through the other um, crown dependencies. I hope the answer wasn't too complicated. Okay, thanks, Rob. Uh, Peter, I'm going to start. Just one, one, one more question for Gary, actually. Uh, you said, Gary, that basically if you want to keep staff or want to bring staff in, you identify them, you can do. Uh, do you feel that you're getting enough people coming to your door or are people not or is industry not aware of this opportunity it, well, in, sorry in terms of new staff well, you said you could either keep staff if you you know to a level yeah. or you can bring in new staff if you identify them do you feel that the the routes you've opened up are being used well enough i think part part of what we can do better is maybe get that message out to industry and that that's one of the reasons I wanted to try and highlight that today that we all uh, just to help businesses understand that uh, in, in terms of the, the, the permit system and the employment permit policy that's that's always been available you know it's, it's online it's, yeah. it's, it's a transparent straightforward policy so I hope that that's relatively user friendly uh, and the extension policies are very simple now if you've got a short term or a medium term you can extend them from five to six and six to seven so that's any role in the epp okay thanks Gary. Yes, Peter. well it's really following up on the point that rob made because uh we have been allowed to, we're not a sovereign state we have been allowed to diverge a bit from the immigration policy of the uk but what they've made clear is that people let's say a waiter comes here for five years that otherwise wouldn't be able to come here that that person should not acquire any kind of residential status now that's very difficult because we've also got a human rights law which came into force in 2006 whereby those people to start put right there so we've got to you know square the circle if there's such a thing and that's going to be very difficult and also let's be honest if you've got a waiter or somebody they come here for five years they might then progress through their career and then eight years or whatever it may be you want that person to be able to put their roots down here and live here so we have got to address that but I've got to say the skill that Robert his team have shown with the immigration uh, authorities in the UK is uh, is considerable uh, because uh, on pure pure UK immigration rules we wouldn't be able to bring a lot of the people in that we've been able to bring in. Right, okay. right, thanks to the panel. Um, now most of you or many of you turned up here today I'm sure to hear what they had to say but I'm sure that also some of you wanted to make a, a contribution to the debate so we're now going to open up to the floor and allow you to do so. Uh, can I just simply invite a show of hands for a question, please? Chris, Chris Blinn, who didn't get the Burgundy Wranglers um, uh, dress code <laughs> notice today. But, uh, Chris, please. Okay, okay. Um, I, was gonna, I don't know how to do this, so I wasn't sure if you were going to simply have to accept it, like retail finance disruption, whatever. So, so if not... I'll ask the question and I'll be the judge. Well, there's a series of points. Oh, sorry, thank you. Um, starting off with um, uh, Kenny's one with the retail, it's really interesting because um, we know from population management that generally retail doesn't apply for licenses unless it's senior management or something. But if you look within the retail businesses, you will see, um, um, I'm going to call it guest workers or non-locals, non but they're generally people who have acquired a uh, right to work through partner or something else, and then they stay here. The reason I mention that is that's what would happen if we did find a way, and as our Chief Minister just mentioned before about um, technically a waiter who's not allowed to get settlement, 
but he correctly pointed out that actually if you look at hospitality as an industry you build your way up you start off as a kp and you can actually end up um and i think we have proper examples in guernsey of people who've built up their career in the sector so i would like to just kind of go back to that thought for the panel to consider the idea that uh, we can um give for example eu settlement or others the route simply through the work they do so that we give them the opportunity and i'd like to also point out that or, or to, to to mention that the work population management and um, the panels done to actually get everyone up to five or seven years is fantastic but we need to look um, beyond that too um and then i'm sorry just i'm just going to hit a few areas for the um, um um nick mentioned on the finance side um that there are you know there's a change here but we should also add that there's been a lot of consolidation in business and the reason for that is the fact it's switched across that we've got higher compliance higher pressures um, permits and what we should be also i'd like to suggest is that it's not just the population management and the and the gba but it's also the gfsc it's, it's encouraging businesses to come here because that will give us the chance to 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 bring those um, uh, people in and i know personally and i'm sure nick will agree there is no problem at all getting um, senior finance people opportunities in guernsey because of the great population management system we have but we should take care that when we bring the senior ones in they might be in their 40s or 50s they will get an eight-year license and they will probably stay and retire here eventually putting more pressure on our ess and other sides as well um um, yeah, look, I, I don't want to, to go through um, um, too much else, but the last little comment will be on the population management. It would be great if there's a suggestion that we could review the list every year going forward. So we look at the needs of industry, whether it be construction, whether it be hospitality or retail, and take this approach where we're more um, active and, and, and av available to, to change as we go along and keep on looking at the sectors rather than just being fixed in our way with a, with, a, with a table there. And also making peeps easier to access, as in to make sure that if businesses want to bring someone out of policy, it can be done with, with we do have a panel, but I know from business experience and talking to people, it's not always that easy to do. And my very, very final point comes to the, I feel I'm like sorry, the bailiff. But, <laughs> <laughs> um, a very final point is, um, Oh, I've almost slipped. It's, it's when we come to applying for hospitality jobs, and I, I would like to hear comments from others in hospitality. We are getting the support to get them um, easier, like, for example, cheaper to, or no cost at all, to, instead of the £120 permit to get them in. That is great. But for the work permits, visa, stroke, we always have to go through this process of going through to prove you've been looking um, for a job. So you have to go through either the job centre or something else there. That adds weeks. Now, either allow those hospitality businesses to keep a rotating advert, because you know for reality, as much as we want the unemployed to be working in hospitality, they sometimes just um, do it because they have to um, acquire look at benefits. But we could speed up the process for the others to make it easier for hospitality to gain their staff. And I do apologize for the long list, but I, I broke it down um, accordingly. Thank you, Chris. Um, on that note about hospitality, Gary, can I just refer that to you? Is, is that uh, a fair point that, uh, that Chris makes there? Um, <laughs> that the hospitality sector you know, isn't able to move perhaps as quickly as it might like at times? It, in, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. I think Chris, I felt Chris was saying that, um, that basically the rules about the fact you have to have advertised for the position before okay, you can bring yeah. somebody in is, is causing delay right just quickly the, the employment permit policy is a live document it's, it can be reviewed at any time we can add or remove roles as, uh, with the support of peep if we can have a sort of sector-wide representation that there's a shortage or a given role it's very easy to add roles to that there isn't a requirement to advertise from a population management perspective at least for any in policy role if it's on that policy, if it's on that list, you're guaranteed a permit for it. So you don't have to evidence recruitment efforts. We're acknowledging there's a shortage of skills and or labour in that role. Right. Okay. Uh, yeah. yeah, thanks, Gary. Um, so uh, Chris had asked for a, a hospitality. I was looking at him already, but Ian Irving Walker's uh, offered to take the mic. So I'm pleased to hear from Ian. Thank you. Well, I thought I thought it's question and answer time, not a political <laughs> statement to Chris, but there you go. <laughs> Ian Walker, a little big hotel group, little big brew co, little green energy all great services. What I think has been asked, and I, and I, and I will sort of reiterate, is it, can you make it quicker? It's taken me three months to employ a member of staff, say for kitchen work or wherever, 
and do can we apply any pressure on UK government to maybe speed that up because that's the major issue we started recruiting and I spent probably 25 30 thousand pounds on recruitment agencies and visas and I'm having to wait. I started six months ago and I reckon by the middle of November I might be getting somewhere close but that's how long it's taking uh, and Ian, so you're spending that amount, how would that compare to what you would have done in a normal year pre-COVID, pre-Brexit? Well, well, we normally have people knocking on the door. Right. You know, well. Have you got any jobs? And we just get a license and on, on we go. It wasn't a problem. So we, we constantly have to advertise in all the nationals. We uh, the recruitment agencies. It's been a real nightmare. And, and there, is a, there is a global shortage. We understand that. And I think, you know, what we offer nowadays is a much better environment as far as our industry is concerned, because the pay is better, and actually it's becoming more of a profession than it used to be. So there are opportunities out there. Thank you. Uh, anybody want to take that? Rob, thank you. Yeah, uh, thank, thank you. I think you make a, a quite a good point around, um, if, if you go back um, pre-COVID pre um, and, and in the days of, of uh, uh, before, before Brexit, um, I, I think the, the population management uh, re regime was coping adequately because, as Gary has, has, has said, um, where there was a labour short, shortage, though, those, those um, types of employment were put, put in scope. But what, what, what has happened is um, I think industry is now having to look further afield um, and, and employ people under the uh, use, using the auspices of, of the immigration acts and that is that is where the um the, the delays are are um it's the uh, it's a more complex process we have the visa we have the visa process um and and you you raised a, a good point about putting uh, pressure on the united kingdom um i th i think what they what they will say is hang on we've got our own um, labour shortages. We've got our own demands on uh, <clears throat> out the British missions ab abroad in issuing I I visas. We will we will do we will do what we can. Um, as we've already highlighted, um, we, we do have we do have leeway. We don't we're not using a points based system, which incidentally adds another uh, uh, layer of, uh, uh, of of delay. Um, but I, I think we we will, as we move forward, have to have more di dialogue with, with, with the with, with the UK, um, uh, and really analyse what 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 our labour shortages are. But I think you've te teased out uh, a, a point there. Um, the population management was is within our own gift gift to give, and I have to say, Gary's team worked very very quickly. The only the assurance I would give you that the immigration team. Do work as quick, quickly as as quickly as they can, and they will <clears throat> give uh, advice to individual bi businesses, which is probably not a service you get uh, at the UK ho Home Office. But no, no, no disrespect to them at all. So, yeah, I, 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 we are in Home Affairs. We are alive to the, the, the problems. We will try and make the process as quick as we possibly can. But um, as we've already pointed out, not all of this is with our gift gift to give. Uh, Ian, you've been in the industry for a long time in, in Guernsey. Uh, yeah. Has this year been the most difficult that you've had? I've never known anything like it. Never. It's been incredible. I can't even get into my own restaurant. We're booking. <laughs> <laughs> Serious. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'm going to come to you in a second, and there's a gentleman behind you. Uh, Kenny, uh, do you want to make a, a <clears throat> comment from your perspective in the retail side? Yeah, just, you know, Gary's obviously mentioned around the flexibility with the current licenses and I have to say that that for me isn't the challenge that we're facing um, you know we're getting a lot of support for extending licenses and colleagues being able to stay the fact that we're needing to recruit, recruit additional resources is a challenge um, and the chamber um, um, survey that's just been done the majority have made it quite clear that you know the, the current challenges we've got aren't solvable with the current um, labour that we've got on the island um, it's quite clear that we need to be able to recruit an Ian's point easily from the EU and beyond. You know, so that, that's what the businesses are telling everybody. That's what the challenge is. Um, I, I welcome the support from, from Gary and the team. And I have to say personally and from the retail side that they've been very proactive and supportive for keeping the people that we have here, um, which is welcome. But it's been able to attract more and fill those vacancies, which is an issue across 
various sectors. I, I guess the challenge for you, Kenny, and I've spoken to Rob on this previously, is that Rob said in hospitality, you can find, you can go out and find people with specialist skills and bring them in, and Gary will facilitate that. I guess you're not really in the market so much for looking for people with specialist skills uh, to to work in retail. Well, I think you know the last few years, I think our focus is more about growing our own talent. You know, so we recognise working with the college and the education team to encourage more students, college leavers, you know, into retail as a career. I think we've got a fairly strong career pathways within retail for shop floor workers to develop through into store management roles and senior positions. Um, and I think with the investment that we're doing and have been doing for a number of years, particularly with a new apprenticeship scheme, um, that's not the challenge for us. The challenge is we need to get product on shelves. Yeah. Uh, we need to be able to serve um, our customers like the restaurateurs do. Um, you know, that's very manual still. Um, we have a very good career pathway. And I think, you know, we've got lots of new students that are attending the apprenticeship scheme, starting off as supervisors, they're now moving through into management positions. Um, and that will continue, but it's not the answer necessarily for yeah. the recruitment challenge we face. Okay, thank you. Uh, so Simon, you know. Thank you, Simon, uh, Deputy Simon of Mullen. So a few years ago, uh, Ricky Gervais said uh, he thought there was light at the end of the tunnel, but it turned out to be some bastard with a torch. Now, <clears throat> I'd really hope that today we could be saying that there is light at the end of the tunnel, although quite clearly after my recent meetings, um, some people in hospitality are really in a crisis point. So I sit on home and I've been one of the biggest critics ever of the population regime which was brought in. I also sit on economic development, so take a pro-business stance. And I, th I think that's helped going through. But I have helped many, many businesses um, get through this emergency and now into where we are with the um, recovery. But I just think I should add um, what we are doing on economic development to encourage people and recruit people into the hospitality. Um, we've created a fantastic video on the benefits of working in Guernsey, and we're now gonna be linking that to an employment agency and a job boards to get people to come across and, and, and come to Guernsey. With the length span, we turn around uh, uh, the visas within one week. We do it electronically. You know, when we started at the beginning of the year, things were quite slow. Um, give you an instance, uh, people in Madeira, you know, they'd have to go to Lisbon to get their um, passport and their visas. Now that can all be done electronically through the British consulate in Madeira. So we are improving uh, the way we and speeding things up and making it easier. But uh, it's the other countries, so the Philippines and, um, you know, Kenya, that sort of thing, that we're recruiting from, from these new pools we've learned to fish from. Um, and if there's any other countries out there that you think we should be recruiting from, please let us know. We're watching that, um, we're watching that all the time. But it is very moving. You know, I've had um, bus drivers, gardeners, cleaners. We've, I've had everybody come to, to me as well and ask me, you know, what they can do to, to help their business survive. So if anybody is really struggling at the moment with their, their uh, company, I'm pleased to talk any time about that and help you through this really, really difficult uh, patch. But I would say um, we've tried very, very hard and we're not giving up yet. We're gonna get through this recovery period and we're gonna get full employment in those positions, in those companies back as soon as we possibly can. Okay. If not sooner. Thank you, Simon. If you want, if you're going to ask a question, you need to say, "Would the panel agree with me that?" <laughs> but, um, so, Peter, and then there's a question. The guy just under the uh, speaker, please. Sir. I mean, I am grateful for Simon's efforts, etc. But it's not as easy as that. People have to pay more. I mean, you mentioned the Philippines, you mentioned Kenya. It may be helpful for, say, a group of hospitality, a group of construction, whatever, to appoint an agent in those jurisdictions to chivvy them along because the delay is not really this side of the water it's over there it's in madeira etc and if you could have somebody on the ground to go and chivvy along the i don't know madeira authorities or whatever it may be so much the better but we've got to face the fact this is going to take a long time to solve it ian's talking about november it'll be better staff we're better staff now 
but it's going to take a long time and wages are going to go up and inflation is already going up inflation is going to be four percent by march april of next year that's going to cause a real problem because we haven't had that kind of inflation for years so uh I'm grateful for your eternal optimism, Deputy Vermeulen, uh, but I think it needs a bit more than optimism. It needs pragmatism and realism, and we're going to be in a battle for a fairly long period of time. What we've got to do as politicians is to listen. You've got to come up with your problems, whatever industry you're in, and tell us. We may not be able to solve them all, but at least we'll try and help. Thank you. Uh, so a question in the back of the room, please. Uh, good afternoon. My name's uh, Lee Madden. Um, I own a company called GR Recruitment, and we brought over the Kenyans um, from Kenya, strangely enough, uh, this year. Uh, we're working in many sectors throughout the world, from Mexico to China, um, Indonesia, uh, uh, Brazil, Europe, and we have got um, on our books around about 4,000 people who could come and help solve your problem. This is across many sectors. So we're working in retail, we're currently working with Jersey Retail, uh, sorry, Guernsey Retail, for Sandpiper, and for Waitrose. Uh, we're trying to solve that problem. We're speaking with facilities cleaning companies over here, but issue the cleaners. If you can't get your school, your offices cleaned, there are solutions. And I think what Guernsey government is doing is absolutely fantastic and commendable. The fact that you're allowing, you've been proactive in doing something and making the wheels of government work. Uh, my question is, how can we make this a little bit faster? How can we ease it? And how can we make maybe the work? The uh, I, I, I firstly feel that speed of the um, work permits is a little bit slow. We could speed it up. Uh, in government, we can make that a little bit quicker, so we're getting people here sooner. And there's many, many solutions out there. But I think one of your big problems, and I don't know how it's going to be addressed um, as, as, an, as the island, and we're trying to address it, it's trying to be addressed in Jersey as well, is when we get people here, and if we get, say, a thousand people to come work here to solve the, solve the issues, where are they going to stay? I was going to move on to that. Can I ask you first, though, how could you find a thousand people to come to Guernsey, you know, in the next six months? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So numbers wise, there, there are solutions. People do want to come here. So, so the Chief Minister mentions about uh, looking outside, looking outside the box. We've looked outside the, outside the box. We've been working this now for three years. We've seen this coming with, 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 with Brexit being massive issues. So we can find, find the solutions. We know that transient workers stop coming to the islands. We're not getting people come off the plane and just taking a job anymore because it's too difficult. Mm. We currently got a campaign in Madeira where we're going over there to interview Madeira. We're going to go and speak to them over there and make sure we get the right people for construction, for retail, for hospitality. There are solutions, but it's that forward thinking with industry, working together with agents like my, my own and the government that will fix the solution. Thank you. Okay. Anybody, anybody on the panel like to, Peter, perhaps would you uh, take that point that was raised by Lee? You know, sorry, I didn't hear the comment. What am I going to say? Where are they going to stay? Well, housing is a real problem. I mean, and that's the point. But in the hospitality sector, most hospitality businesses provide accommodation for their staff. I know we do, Ian does, not everybody. Housing is a massive problem. Uh, and there's no easy solution. I'm, another one of these things, I didn't think I'd be on so many boards and so many committees when I became a uh, uh, president, uh, PR. Chief Minister, I thought people would actually get things done, but people like to sit down and talk about things. Uh, and uh, I'm on a housing action group. We just bought Kenilworth Library for six and a half million pounds of state's tax money in, in relation to that. That's going to provide 130 homes. We need 500 homes there and then. There is no easy solution. It is an expensive place. But if you can bring in a thousand people tomorrow, next week or whatever, come and speak to us as politicians. We'll sit down with you and we'll try and achieve a practical way of dealing with it. And we'll speak with the businesses because that's the first time I've heard somebody say that they can bring in a thousand people that quickly. Because Ian knows, and I know, and lots of other people know, it ain't that easy. And can I just touch on one other thing about, uh, you talked about um, low unemployment levels, et cetera, et cetera. I can remember years ago, and Rachel may remember because she was working with us at the time, we were approached by the Housing Authority, I think it was, to say, will you employ some local people in our businesses, uh, you know, work along your kitchen borders, et cetera. We said we'd be delighted. Rachel organised it. Trouble was, and we were going to pay them, even though the state said we didn't have to pay them, because we thought they should have the dignity of earning the money. Our kitchen porters, our chefs, etc., were working 48 hours a week minimum. Uh, these people weren't capable of working more than 30 hours a week, we were told by the authorities, because uh, they weren't used to work. Now, they were never going to get used to work unless they worked, and we couldn't have that. We couldn't have our kitchen porters working, you know, 12-hour shifts, four days a week, or whatever it was, with a bloke who was going home at three o'clock in the afternoon. That's the, I think some of the local people have got to realise, be real. If you want a job in the hospitality sector, 
you've got to meet the rules, not the other way around. And if not, well, then we'll have to keep employing uh, workers from overseas. Yeah. Well, thank you, Pete. Um, sorry, Susie Crowder had to uh, hand up, if I could go there. Thank you. Hi, I think it's really important we take uh, a multi-dimensional approach when we're looking at the population management crisis and the recruitment crisis. Uh, I think the, 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 the real threat we've got on the horizon because of our aging population is long-term care and providing the right skills and human capital to, to, to make suitable and sustainable provision in the area, notwithstanding the times in construction, in retail and hospitality, as we've heard today. So I think there is a bit about growing our own, but if you look at the track record of government initiatives such as Skills Guernsey, frankly, it's been ghastly. It has. Uh, the evidence is completely lacking. Um, and so I would suggest that government stops wasting time playing in that area and allows industry to do what we're good at in shaping that human development strategy that this island desperately needs. The other element when we turn that lens to financial services, which let's face it, is the significant component part of our economy, and let's hope it stays that way, Wearing my GT hat, increasingly, a lot of my work is spent advising clients on what they can do outside of this jurisdiction because, frankly, they can't get the skills that they need to do what they need to do right now in a cost-effective manner. Please don't be uh, um, arrogant or, or, or lacking in your open mind to think that organisations won't look outside of the geography of our lovely bailiwick because the talent is out there, it's just not geographically bound to our bailiwick. And that is a significant threat to our economy, both now and in the short and medium term. So let's just be realistic about what we're looking at here. And my question to you is, so what now, what? Oh, please. Yeah, I'll have stabbed hearts in that one. Um, yeah, um, I, I pick up the point, um, if I've understood it uh, correctly, uh, around um, not concentrating on one, one industry uh, hospitality uh, you've got to, you've got to look at look at it in the round and if that if that was your your point um, uh, there, there's there's certainly no, no arrogance around that we we, we absolutely get it um, one point I would make I, I mentioned it in in my introductory remarks is um, whether you think skills Guernsey is p performing well or not at the moment, Certainly, this is an, uh, a whole area that I know um, uh, my colleague Andrew Dully Owen, who sits, uh, sits on the review panel, is very keen uh, to, to address. Um, and the, a lot, lot, lot of this is around trying to encourage lo local people into local industries. Um, uh, you know, the constru construction industry has been, been around um, forever, hospitality has been around forever. Uh, for, for forever, uh, our, our transport needs needs are there, and, and, I, and I think um, uh, one of, one of the um, remarks that I, I've bol balked on on uh, the suggestion are oh, these are not jobs for locals. Mm. Well, we've got to change that yeah. because we've absolutely got to change that, and and we've got to encourage not only um, the, um, the 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 un unemployed, or we call them job job seekers now. Um, it's not just that that market that we, we've got to work on. It's uh, p people who uh, the, our youngsters who who are coming up to um, uh, to leaving school, send them all off to off to university. Well, I, th I think our local industries have have got to do um, their bit with with, with within the skills guarantee environment or or wh where, wherever that that. Uh, takes us in, in, in the future. We really have to get the message out that uh, we we want to, to keep uh, local young youngsters, keep young people on on Guernsey, and and tell them how attractive the, uh, the hospitality industry is. You know how you can have a good get, uh, career in construction, and so on and so, so forth. So yeah, I mean, what if if uh, hopefully I'm giving you some some reassurance, but but certainly the point around look, looking at this holistically rather than um, in, in individual um, uh, in industries, and we do have a, 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 the, the population employment advisory panel, um, who, whose job it is really um, is to, to look at all these areas and um, ad advise uh, the population administrator where there are st staff shortages. But I get your point. It's it's, it's about analysing 
all the avenues that, that uh, whether whether it's bringing people in from off island, whether it is whether it is the lo local uh, um, uh, skills that we that we, we need to, to train and nurture and get them working in in traditional Guernsey industry. Um, if I could just ask Eric Jensen, there seems to be an issue with the door <laughs> in the back. If we could fix it, thank you. Um, uh, sorry, there was a question just yeah on that table there, please, and then we're going to head here. Thank you. Um, if we could just go back to the housing piece, because I think there's some underlying issues with, with here. We've talked about people have already left the island. Yeah, um, you know, COVID issues or whatever, away from their families too long, wanting to go home, all that sort of thing. Um, there's one bubbling up underneath that already at the moment, because, you know, it's great that we've heard about licenses being extended for people or whatever, but, you know, that those people here in rented accommodation, and that's, you know, those like... Uh, those uh, rental agreements are coming up for renewal and they're seeing those rents going through the roof and that's driving people out even before people have got here and they're looking to see what it's going to cost to live on this island so you know i'm really concerned about the housing it'd be great if we could bring this thousand people here at the moment i'm quite pleased to hear today that we're talking about you know changes to permits or whatever because you know it seems like there's a lot of talk about hospitality in here today which is a good thing probably because it helps the rest of us like in retail we've probably suffered in the past around that yeah in terms of being able to get licenses and get people here but you know with all due respect to the guys from hospitality that's probably forcing the issue a little bit at the moment but the housing is a huge issue and i'm seeing you know excuse excuse me but you know i'm not local but i'm seeing a bit of a disconnect here between the local population and the real problem that we've got on this island at the moment trying to get food on tables yeah social media is full of comments about i couldn't get served today service was poor in there i had to sit and wait for an hour whatever you know and all i want to say to these people is is wake up and smell the coffee a little bit there's a really good reason for that and those people who are working in your you know those restaurants and working silly hours yeah are also doing two jobs probably and working in retail and trying to um doing extended hours in those jobs um, and they haven't got access to accommodation. It's great to say hospitality to give it to them. We've clearly got a huge problem if hospitality can't get them because they, they, they can offer the, the, that, host, that, that accommodation in their, in their buildings. If they can't get people with that, that benefit, then what, what help have the rest of us got? But the disconnect that I see is, you know, and please correct me if I'm wrong here, but I mean, I saw a story in the paper last week that almost seemed to celebrate 68 house house development being turned down by deputies I, I'm, apologies if i've got that wrong that's how i kind of read it but that you know on the basis of um concerns around traffic increases yeah now if we want to sort traffic out stop closing the road so often that might be the bigger issue this island. yeah but you know I, i'm concerned that residents you know that we've got to we're, we're refusing a development and you know, it, it felt almost like that was good news. Yeah, <laughs> when you know we should be building whatever we can. This young people on this island who want somewhere to live in affordable accommodation. Yeah, thank, regardless thank you, of trying to bring. Thank you for the question. In. I'll ask Peter to answer it. Our next question is coming from down here. Okay. Uh, but Peter, that, yes. that was a brilliant, brilliant contribution. Thank you for doing it. And your example of the sixty-eight uh, houses refused at points wrong. Two of the members who refused that were on economic development as well. I couldn't believe it. The people who are supposed to promote the island then decided they were going to vote against planning. You're looking at it. The people who are on economic development are also on the DPA uh, were, were voting against it. Absolute madness. Uh, we've got to realise that, uh, and I sit on the housing action group, as I say, and there's one member there. We say, oh, we think we could build 12 hours there or 10 hours there or six hours. Oh, well, we'll have a traffic problem. We'll have this problem. So in the end, I said to this particular person, I'm not going to name the gender, <laughs> say the gender of that because you might guess who he or she might be. Are we going to build any houses anywhere? You know, because there's always a problem. We have 24 square miles. When I was born, the population of this island was 43,000. When I came back with my family, I had me a lawyer in England for some years, 40 years ago now, it was 53,000. It's now 63,500. It's more densely populated than it ever was. But if we want a vibrant island, our economy is five or six times in real times, the size it was 30, 40 years ago. We've, we've got affluence. People have a better standard of living than they ever had when I grew up as a kid. The problem we've highlighted is an exact one. We've got to solve that. It's supply and demand. We've got to create more supply. If we get economic development members sitting on the De Development and Planning Authority saying no to that kind of development, 
then we might as well paddle our canoe and go somewhere else. I, I sincerely hope that those people get some realism going forward. Yes, Nick. Um, I thought that was a great statement there too. I thought it was really, and I had a conclusion written down here about all the problems. It sounded a bit pithy to say this, this is what needs to be done, because I don't know. I really don't know. But I did link it all back to the current housing thing. Um, I know we're looking forward today, but last summer there was speculation and talks that a significant employer was going to come to Guernsey and there were going to be jobs and it was going to be brilliant. And even then I was thinking, well, I don't know where these people are going to live. And one of the people, was, um, one of the partners in an accountancy practice, who I think they brought 30, 30 staff members over this year alone, is, is embarrassed to show the accommodation that they're going to have to put their staff in. You then link it to, and this is why it's tendrils that overlap. You look at young graduates who you want to employ, who can't, won't be able to afford housing as it goes up, or whose jobs maybe don't exist in Guernsey. And it links then to the demographic time bomb and aging population. And I'm really not bright enough to understand it all, other than we just can't kick this down the road. Agreed. Yes. Uh, so, question over here, uh, Andrew, are you ready to serve? Okay. Right. Fine. Well, one or two questions more. Hi. Okay. Sorry. Thank Hi. You. I'm, my name is Katie. Um, the panel and lots of the questions have really focused on immigration and bringing people into the island. Um, and so I'm really glad to hear Susie mention the population profile, which is obviously a big factor in this and that we've got a high number of dependents for work for the working population. And that's only going to get worse over time. What I was interested to know is does the panel think that industry could do more to make um, these jobs that they're finding difficult to fill attractive to the population we have. There are, I actually got my ear bent by somebody recently who was saying nobody wants to employ me because I'm, I'm too old and he was 65 and healthy and fit and we're all living much longer than we ever have done before and we're fit and healthy and we can be useful members of our community, particularly in caring professions. Um, and in a, as an example, I went to the Shore Recruitment um, event recently where they were inviting young people and older people in to look at fiber optic splicing and, and that kind of thing and as opportunities for jobs within the community and part of the things that they really emphasize is the ability to be flexible which we've seen a lot in white collar industry now particularly post-covid with technology if we could make our jobs more flexible in other industries is there an opportunity to encourage people more back back into the work within our current population okay thank you um so kenny uh sell us a job in retail and uh and tell us how flexible you're prepared to be well i think what, what i touch on first is we've had a really interesting conversation with the job center the last couple of weeks around the non-working cohort that's out there you know so looking at encouraging that group of um the population that are no longer working whether they're retired or secondary jobs no longer doing um, that work um, or even looking for employment and we recognize that's something we need to um, work harder at so you're absolutely right um, but we are a service based business most of our challenges and probably the hospitality guys is at weekends and on late nights it's unsociable um, and I think it touches on a couple of other panel members you know there is a reality there that if you want a job it, it, it can't just be that it's nine to five it can't just be that it's in the morning um, I can recruit next week for morning jobs but if we can recruit for late nights and weekends then it's a real challenge for us um i think the other interesting conversation with the job center is we focus on the unemployed which is right and i think we've all got our doubts whether how many of that unemployed are employable it's a small number and we can work hard to upskill and uh, and train and develop um but there's over a, a thousand maybe um people that are no longer working um because they're off work with whether it be mental health um, sickness. So how, how are we working with that return to work program? How can we support that? Um, so there are other cohorts that we can look at, um, you know, aging population. You know, we've got colleagues working in retail that are, you know, nearly 70 that have been working for 25 years. So we recognize the value of that group of um, uh, the population uh, and we do support that flexible working. We, we're not really focused on, you know, it has to be full time. Um, and we will support working parents. Um, we will provide flexible working arrangements. 
Um, but the reality is we're a seven day a week, um, 24 op operation now with summer businesses that are now looking at facing into the increasing competition with online. Um, you know, so it's not an easy one to, to square off unless we get that flexibility. A standard full-time role with the co-op, how many hours a week? 39. Uh, we'll, we'll, we, we have, and I think a couple of people have mentioned that some of our colleagues are working you know, 48, 50, 60 yeah. hours. Yeah. Um, some of them will even be working that number of hours with us and then working in hospitality for a, a similar number of hours. Yeah. Um, but uh, you know, as, a, as an employer, we generally will stick to the 48. Okay, yeah. um, you know, we'll make sure that we've got a duty of care. Um, but yeah, it's typically 39 hours as a full-time um, job. Peter, from a hospitality point of view, what's the standard hours for a hospitality industry nowadays? Well, if I get it wrong, you know, correct it. It's 48 to 60, I would say. Yeah, he'd say, yes, that's about it. That's about it. Yeah. Uh, and those people are burnt out generally because they've been having to work flat out for a long period of time and they need, they need some help. Uh, I guess, it, I mean, Ian, you could perhaps say this point, you know, over the past 12 months, you know, all these industries under pressure have been, you know, people have had to put extra shifts in, haven't they? That's, that's the way you've got through. So I'm going to give our panel a, time, a little bit of time off now because it is time for, uh, time for lunch. Uh, however, we will, I believe this probably demand to keep going. So we'll have a quick lunch and then we'll, uh, we'll reconvene shortly uh, until we finish at two o'clock. Okay, thank you.
Um, so we're going to restart. We've got about 10 minutes left. Uh, to, I'm going to touch on a sector that we haven't spoken about so far. Well, it's been alluded to, but we haven't got, uh, gone into any depth on it, uh, which is construction. And uh, John Bamkin from the Guernsey Construction Forum is with us today. So, uh, John, uh, um, oh, can we get a mic to John? Sorry. Yeah, good afternoon. Um, yeah, we, we've got an industry that is used to gear up and gear down, depending on the, the economy, um, in terms of its workers. Um, we do rely on quite a lot of skilled and unskilled labour coming in from uh, EU countries and, and places like that. Um, and just going back to the point about where we're going to house everybody, you know, I, I'm, I've been on the island 18 months, so that's probably a daft question to ask, but I'm going to ask it anyway. So, when, you know, when you look at housing, and, and yeah, great that we are buying land and, and going to put some houses on it, but that's going to take a long time. And I see an awful lot of, um, you know, buildings uh, that are just ready made for doing something more quickly. Um, Laray Hotel, for example, the Old Quarter, all those sort of areas. So are there any plans from the states to look at maybe procuring more of the buildings that already exist and brownfields and develop in that area to bring people in? You mentioned Luray. The states have deregulated Luray in the sense it was for, for hotels that now said it could be for something else. That's in private industry uh, and the old quarters all privately owned. There are no plans. You're just using those, I know, as an example. No plans for those. But again, it is a, an instance. If people come and speak to us, we could say, well, what about this? What about the other? There may be things we can do. I mean, Kenilworth Vinery moved very quickly in relation to that. Uh, and I know that's just a, you know, a drop in the ocean, but at least it's a drop in the ocean where the bucket was uh, completely empty before. So it is a, we haven't got any plans to do that, but there's no reason why we can't. There's no reason why we can't work with e.g. the construction industry and look at that. Thank you, John. Um, I'm going to go to my left because I was very conscious that halfway through that I'd been looking at you even so uh, I apologize for that. Are there any questions from the uh, from that side of the room? Uh, Hannah? Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, Hannah Beacon from Island Coachways. One of the things that I think needs to be addressed, but I don't know how you do it, is I feel that our guest workers are not made as welcome as they could be by a significant minority on the family of, of the uh, sorry of the island um it's a personal point to me that my daughter who happened to be very local born but with a uk registration was tackled in our road outside our house um and was made to feel very unwelcome she is one of the graduates that won't be coming back because her you know she's she's of a generation that expects diversity expects acceptance um and she's looking at another generation that doesn't give it okay interesting boy uh Kenny, you employ a fair few guest workers. Have you, have you got any experience of that? Uh, well, we employ a few, but I, I think the key bit for me is that you, know, you mentioned diversity and inclusion. You know, I think that comes to the values of your business and the values of us as an island. So, you know, I, I think that most businesses will see the value in having that diversity and inclusion first and foremost and how they operate. Um, how do we educate more? Yeah, yeah, it's absolutely something we need to be encouraging, but um, I, I can only see it as a strength from a personal perspective from how we run our business, you know, having that diversity and inclusion certainly a benefit to us as a business. So I, I share your concerns and it's certainly something that as an island we need to be doing more. Um, I don't think we should be educating our, our youngsters. I think they're probably the, the age group that are quite strong in that respect. Um, so, yeah. Okay, thanks, Kenny. Uh, any further questions? No, nobody else in there? Anybody else in the room? Elaine. Oh, sorry. Don't know. Yeah, we talked about property, <clears throat> and one of the my, uh, my son's just recently moved here on an out of policy medium term employment permit. Thank you. And um, uh, but of course he's brought a dog with him. And he's staying with us in an open market property at the minute, but to try and get him into a local market property uh, with a dog is absolutely impossible. So what are we doing about this? You know, dogs and children, no, you can't rent a property with dogs and children. Nobody's interested. And he's getting married next year. His fiance is coming over from America. So we've got those problems to sort out. The last we need is to, is to try and find a property for him. Gary, you're looking at me with poppy dog eyes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, 
I, I'm not sure how to, to answer that. We don't have a permit for dogs. It's, it's, a, it's a fair point. Um, I, I don't think necessarily the panel can resolve it. But... Well, we have resolved, as regards children, the states have made a decision about, you know, you can't advertise or you can't not take children. I mean, uh, depend on the, the nature of the property. I've got to say, you know, uh, uh, as a dog owner, I sympathise, but I wouldn't like to be, I'm, I'm sorry, I mean, I fully sympathise with your son's situation, and I'm no doubt the dog's got a, uh, a good home with you, uh, but I don't want to be in a situation where I'm going to tell people that they've got to have a dog in their property or a cat in their property, or, a, or, or some people even got pet snakes. I don't want to do that. That's not the kind of society I want. So uh, this politician, although he sympathises considerably, uh, and I think it's a libertarian, won't be saying that people have got to take dogs in their homes, uh, in, in their rental properties if they don't want to. Okay. Fair point. Uh, do we have any other question in the room? Yeah, uh, Simon, have there, please? Oh, uh, sorry, let's do that lady first and then Simon will come to you. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, I'm coming from the construction company. And obviously we are dealing with shortage of the staff. Uh, we are at the moment trying to complete our building projects, yeah, because we have a lot of pressure from the clients who are getting less understand, they do understand less at the moment. When it's more, more pressure, obviously, if the building projects are delayed, there's really a lot of pressure on us. We're trying to recruit people from UK. And obviously we are offering our employees more money at the moment. When that, what does it mean for us? We are going to get less profit at the end. Our quotations are underestimated because of the shortage of the staff. We have to pay more our employees who are coming from UK. But that's not the problem because we agreed with my husband, we are running building companies, to not lose reputation of our company. We agree that we will make less money, obviously because at the moment we are investing in the people who are going to work in Guernsey. But what I found recently is an extremely shocking situation in Guernsey. I am the person who is doing interviews. I am the person who is talking to the people who are living in UK. I am the person who is answering the questions about accommodation, yeah? What is shocking for me, I need to tell these people the price of the room which is 200 pounds per week, but doesn't matter because me and my husband, we agreed that we'll be paying half, okay? We are not going to make a money. As I said, our quotations are underestimated. There were pandemics, extra cost involved, all right? But the conditions of the, of the rooms, shared accommodations are not acceptable. I am shocked and unfortunately, Guernsey economy is based on the foreigners, and that's the truth because the local people are quite um, selective in the jobs, yeah? But they have been underestimated for a long time. And if someone has a choice to work in UK and get a salary and live in the room for 80 pounds, which has a clean carpets and lovely walls, they don't want to live in the palace. They deserve dignity. But when someone is coming to Guernsey, he's paying 200 pounds per room, and the conditions of this room is not acceptable. Obviously, it's the question to the landlords with the shared accommodation, but honestly, I cannot accept this fact. So we had the people from UK who arrived to Guernsey. We offered them highest salaries, but they said to me, do you really want me to live in this type of accommodation? You must be joking. Okay. They're working a lot of hours. They're working minimum 60 hours per week and the build the job is not easy. It's a difficult job. They deserve to come back to the room, room, yeah, but with the clean carpets, yeah. some dignity for them. Okay. Foreign people are underestimated. They're overlooked and no one is talking about the conditions. How do they work? They're working extremely hard. Okay, thank you. It's a very fair yeah. point. Uh, the unsung heroes of the Guernsey economy, I think we uh, had on the front page a few months ago. Um, Peter, have you got uh, any response? Well, uh, Rob and I were just talking about that while you were asking, you're making your point. 
Just last week, we passed an enabling law, which means it's a law that can then for make ordinances, etc., which is going to address the kind of problems you talk about, because there are lots, not lots, there are some, I don't know how many, there are some properties that are exactly the condition you said that that's unsatisfactory. So the states will, by ordinance now, be able to address that, but it'll take a time. I don't know if you want to add anything, Rob. No, that, that, that's a, a, absolutely right. I think we described this as um, the perfect storm. And I think the, the, the state of some rented accommodation, uh, as you described, has uh, the perfect storm has flushed this out. And uh, at least we have some enabling le legislation, but we, we listen to you loud, loud and clear. Okay, thank you. Uh, we're going to move on to the next question, or final question, actually, is Simon Delarue there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Simon Delarue, Little Big Group. Um, I'm actually just going to go back to the point that Hannah made about culture. Um, and as a relatively not so young person anymore, um, it feels to me that I don't quite think, um, I understand that private industry understands culture and they understand young people's desire to be sustainable, look after the environment and care for each other. And sometimes I don't necessarily think that is what we sort of get from the state sometimes in that um, looking to see that cultural shift in action and sometimes respect. I know it's been a very challenging time so far in the first year, but um, I think there's a very large piece across the island as a whole in what our culture is, how we treat our environment, how we treat one another. Um, that needs to shift before we can see uh, young people, graduates um, returning to the island because it's culturally a place that they want to live and work. And I think as long as we have problems that Hannah is talking about, um, our recruitment crisis will continue to be an issue. Um, and I'd be interested, I know that Kenny did touch on the point, I was just wondering how um, Peter and Rob might sort of speak to the those sort of cultural issues that you may find. In so you're effectively state. saying that it's not just the economic issues, Simon, it's actually do people want to come back to or come to Guernsey at all? Uh, I, I, th I think so. Um, and sometimes, you know, it's a bit of a shame when we sort of going on about talking about the clothes that people wear in the States. I, I understand, you know, there is an element of that, but um, we're, you know, we're, we're watering the flowers whilst the house is on fire. Um, I don't understand, well, I do, I do understand why it's being talked about, but for those young people looking into Guernsey and looking at front pages like that or news articles like that, going, is this really the most important thing we have to talk about? And it's, for me, it's a big long-term cultural piece. It's, there's not a quick answer, there's not a quick fix, um, but I'd just be interested on the uh, thoughts of Peter and Bob have. Thank you. The floor is yours, please. Hannah highlighted, sadly, a bigoted attitude of some of our community, uh, and that's terrible. And um, we've all seen examples of that, you know, uh, when COVID was, it's not gone away, but it was more prevalent than it is now. People with English cars were getting abused because what are you doing in our island, et cetera, et cetera, you can't come to the, our restaurant. I bore that completely. Culture changes. What I would say, what I would say, having come back to Guernsey in 1980 with my family, I left England, because uh, it was a violent place. It was an antisocial place. It was a place where you couldn't let your kids, I had three young kids then, got four now, well, they're grown up now. Uh, they, you couldn't let your kids walk down the street because they get attacked or molested. We haven't got that kind of culture here. That doesn't mean to say we can't, we must be complacent. We are a much more homogenous, liberal society than most places, but we're a small society. We'll always carry on that cultural uh, shift, Simon, because life changes. Uh, you know, when you think just 40 years ago, uh, 50 years ago, if you're a homosexual, you went to jail in England uh, and in Guernsey and lots of other places. Thankfully, we moved on from that kind of society. Uh, and we've got a society now, which is, I think, I think people would come at this, all the problems of housing crisis and all that kind of stuff. But if you bring your family here, and you grow your family up here, it's safer here than it is just about anywhere else, unless you live on a Hebridean island with four people on it. Uh, but that doesn't say we shouldn't do more to, to, to the cultural change. So quickly then, Rob. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Peter makes a, um, a, a very valid point about this being a very, very safe and secure place. And I'll just deal with that first. Um, if, if you look at the, um, the UK immigration regime, which, which we follow, one of, one of the first duties of government is, is to keep us safe and secure and, and away from, from criminality. And I think that on, on a cultural front, that's where we get, get a, a tick. As Simon um, 
um, in, interesting, I'm um, a lot, lot older than you. I, I've got um, a, a daughter who's graduated who's come back to the island, and I've got a son who's graduated who, who's living work, working in London. It'd be great to have have them all, all, all back here, and who, who knows what that, that happened. But certainly, my, my, my daughter is the, uh, for the first to remind me about the, the environment and about um, you know, treat, treating pe people fa fairly. And, and so I think it is a cultural thing, and I think it's incumbent upon us all to, 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 to change that, that culture. Uh, and uh, I, <clears throat> I think you're right, it, it's all part, part and parcel of 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 where where we need to go and i think um where there is unpleasantness is often not the young people it's it's where where that's um that that cult culture has become ingrained but certainly as far polit politically as far economic development um and home home affairs we absolutely value um and recognize the need for for um, workers um from overseas coming coming to enrich enrich our culture and provide us the skills that we haven't got and that message is absolutely ta taken on, on, on board but we also reckon the, the pressures on housing the pressures on our, our on our on our services and that's that's the balance um but certainly the, on the issue of co culture um you you make a very good point but um two questioners have, have teased that out and you're right to do so OK, thank you, Rob. Uh, look, in this chair, there's, or in this uh, position, there's two things I hope to try and do to you, uh, for you. One is to entertain you uh, via the panel, and secondly, is to finish on time. And with two deputies on the panel, it's been a bit of a challenge. But I'm hoping I'm just squeaking into the line and introduce Kay to uh, just wrap the event up for the Chamber. Thank you. Thank you. Can you can you hear? Um, I just wanted to say that we are very grateful for the turnout and the engagement that you've shown today. Special thanks to the panel. I think they've been a, an awesome combination of skills, insight, experience and willingness to speak very frankly about the issues that we all need to address. Um, Chamber has a breadth of reach and a willingness to forward information in a way that we, we feel is really very helpful to those in the state sector. So please um, take, do take part in the survey. We welcome the increased level of engagement that we're having with various states committees. Um, it's definitely been a, a mindset change and we're, we're delighted to have that, but we need all of you to engage to uh, enable us to forward data. You know, Chamber's very pragmatic. We deal with actual scenarios. We provide real data. We don't hypothesize and we're not subjective, but we need all of you to feed into that. And I would thank you for coming along today and, and ask you to help us by continuing this momentum. So please complete the survey and um, thank you for coming along and a special thank you to our panel, but also to James, who I think did a fantastic job of moderating. Thank you.